Welcome to the Speaking of Jazz podcast series with Manny Kellogg in association with Music Tribes Unite News. Now let's get started. Well, I'd like to say hello, jazz lovers, and welcome to uh, this segment. I am very honored and happy to have a very good friend of mine. He is a uh, recording artist, he's a producer, he's a writer, a great performer, he's a vocalist, guitar, guitarist, he plays jazz and blues. And I'm telling you, the man is killing. He's a very dear friend of mine. We've had the uh, opportunity of working together on several occasions. And I'd like to welcome to the show today, my good friend, Mr. David, be cold. How you doing, my man? Let's talk. Well, I'm good morning. I'm good. Uh, how how did everybody listening to, man? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Well, you look you know, shocked as you always do. <laughs> bless your heart, brother. You look good too, man. Well, thank uh, you. God bless, bless, bless us to be alive and still kicking. You know. Amen. Amen. I hear you. Uh, you know, we we we've never really had the chance to just do some basic talks. I want to just relax and for the next uh, whatever amount of time we have, I just want to talk about uh, David Cole, what he's doing. And I want to start off, uh, man, tell me about uh, where you're from. Oh, I was born in DC, um, you know, schooled in DC, families, DC. Uh, that's me, baby, DC, from DC. That's yeah, what they yeah. call <laughs> On on that note, Brother David, uh, what and who were some of your most, uh, shall I say, your best and your in best influences uh, to bring you along? Well, I, I tell you, um, I'm number five out of six six children, right? So my brother, that was number two, that was my man. You know, he died. He died. He's been gone for a little while. But he took me everywhere as a young guy, you know, when I was, he looked after me, he took care of me, and he exposed me to so much. So basically, I mean, he exposed me to uh, music, you know? Yeah, I, yeah. Look, I, I, let me tell you something. I remember we used to do so much together. We had to wash dishes. I'd be kneeling in a chair right next to him, and we'd be doing the dishes together, and he'd be singing these songs, man, you know? And yeah, I started yeah. learning these songs just hanging out with him, you know? It was a trip. Yeah, dig it, dig it. I hear you, man. Well, who are the uh, some of the people that you really enjoyed working with and, and playing behind and recording with? Yeah, you know, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, well, well, really, I, the guys in my neighborhood, everybody had an instrument. Pretty much, it seemed like so. We all had a ball just getting together in people's backyards or basements and playing. I remember walking, you know, long distances, carrying my guitar and amp and, and stuff. And and these guys, some of these guys are still playing. They're still around and, and they're doing quite well, you know, yeah. and some of them stopped, you know. I remember I used to get, by the time I get to the house, my arms, it felt like my arms were longer from carrying my amp <laughs> and my um, my guitar. And then you have a little bag with the wires and effects pedal. Boy, I remember, whew, goodness, I remember some times. And, uh, you know, you'd ask me about people I enjoyed playing with. Well, that was like my roots, you know? And and then, then there was a couple of guitar players in my neighborhood that I would go over to their house and listen to them as much as I could and watch them play. And I'd ask them things, you know, so, one guy named Jerry Gordon, he was a fantastic guitar player, um, pretty much a West Montgomery uh, yeah. stylist or George Benson stylist guy. And he really helped me a lot. And I mean, he was one of my favorite guitar players. And I know George Benson and him had a had a brief relationship and um, they both admired each other's plans. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Jerry. He was a dynamite. So he was a very influential to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, we listened to records all the time back then. And so, you know, we were listening to Wes Montgomery and Kenny Burrell and Nathan Page and Donna Levy and, I mean, uh, Grant Green. We were listening to everybody. And, I, and I'm like, uh, 
I'm like 14, 15, even though yeah, back then yeah. I was still listening to, to a lot of uh, rock music too, because I, I enjoyed, uh, well, see, when I'm talking about my brother, he came back from college on the West Coast and he bought all these albums, right? And back then, you think about it, in, um, we had AM radio. I so remember DC, that. Yeah, DC, you had two black stations, W-O-O-K <laughs> and W-O-L. And I mean, you know, we would go from station to station to see who was playing the latest hits, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah. listening to, you know, I'm listening to um, Clarence Carter and Curtis Mayfield and James Brown, you know, the oldest. Yeah. Red wow. That's right. And you're hearing all of this stuff, but you're hearing some great guitar players on this music, you know? Yeah, and as yeah. a kid, man, that, that, that thing caught my interest. And I, look, I remember in like the third grade, I remember the third grade. So I, you asked me about the influences. I had to go back to bring man, you take, forward. Take right? your time. Go on back, man. Go yeah, ahead. Man, on. You, we, the, the dudes were starting a, like a, a Temptations type of group, you know? Everybody wanted to get up there and do that because the Temptations were the hottest thing happening at that point. But I couldn't sing and do the steps at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. I could. I had a good voice because I guess my voice didn't break yet. You know, you know how you when you get when you get mature, you uh, go through puberty, your voice breaks. So yes, I sir. had a good voice, but I didn't. Um, man, I my sisters never taught me how to dance, man, and I couldn't do it. And uh, so I wound up gravitating towards the guitar. So I'm still with the cats, and we having a good time, you know. And so that's how I kind of got started you know look i remember i remember when um i remember we were in school and uh the guys were getting out of class right i'm like how they getting out of class i want to get out of class too you know school was boring they were going down to the orchestra room and no, nobody hit me to that because i never played an instrument so i went down there and i tried to get a trumpet right the dude only had violins left and like back then you didn't want to play no violin you know and uh, just like you didn't want to wear glasses because the guys would take your glasses off and say, pow, punch you right in the face, right? Then what you yeah, going to yeah. think you're going to do in, 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 in D.C., in a black neighborhood, you going to run around with a violin? Man, you you would have caught it back then, you know? So I remember, man, we speaking of violin, man. I remember uh, when I was coming up back then, my mom tried to get me to play the violin, accordion the piano, the flute, everything but the drum. But I said, no, Ma, I want to play the drum. She said, that's too much stuff for you to be carrying around, boy. You know, and I said, you need, to, you, need to, you need to play the piano or something like that that you can just get up and walk away from. I didn't want to hear it. I wanted to play the drums. Now, to this very day, man, I love the piano. Still don't like playing violin because I don't understand all the, all the notes and stuff. But uh, as far as playing uh, the piano, violin, all I, I couldn't stand it back then. I wanted to be a drummer, you know. So I think I understand what you're saying about the violin, because I didn't want to be walking around no violin either. But now it's a beautiful instrument. Absolutely, you know? but you know, it, it, I think it was basically it was kind of looked at as feminine or something like that, you know. And, and I grew up back in them days, man. You had to be you had to be hard. You had to be tough. If you wasn't you were going to get beat up all the time. Yeah. You know, like yeah, I said, yeah. even wearing glasses, man, you know, the cats would take your glasses off and steal you in the face, then put your glasses back on. <laughs> you know, I mean, how are you doing that to a kid, man? You know, that's it's really abusive, man. But, you know, hey, man, we had to go through that stuff, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah. so, you know, the guitar was cool. It kept me out of a lot of trouble, you know. I could go into other neighborhoods and wouldn't, didn't get beat up because... Back then, if you went into another neighborhood, you know, and you weren't from the from the neighborhood, cats want to take your jacket or your shoes or punch you around or whatever, you know. And but but mm -hmm. since you, it's just like the same thing with athletes, you know, you could go into the other neighborhoods, you know, because people gave you a little different uh, uh, a little different respect, I guess, you know, you which you basically, you know, you got to be cool about whatever you're doing, but so. I had a man, I had so many friends that I grew up playing with and learning just us just teaching each other, you know, because I mean, it wasn't like we were going, I didn't have no money to take any guitar lessons back then. Yeah. And in DC, you really, you had Bill Harris, and um, Bill Harris was a great guitar player, 
And he also had a great club called the Pig Feet where he bought all of the jazz greats in, man. I mean, and I, I used to go in there and I'm like, Jerry and I would go there. We sometimes walk. We'd have to walk a few miles just to get there, man. And, I, and I'm like 15 or 16, man, you know, and I'm just trying to learn about the music and, and hang out. And I remember I didn't take lessons from him. So he, you know, and I did, I was a kid. I didn't have any money to go in there and no. buy. You couldn't buy any drinks. You were too young, you know, right. and he's trying to run a business, you know, and he'd always want to run me out of there, you know, and it was a piano player, the great John Malachi. I remember he was, he was the house piano player. And he always say, let him stay, Bill. Let him play. Let him play. And I would play a couple of little numbers, like so like something like Summertime or Misty, you know. And uh, and, and then I would leave. I, you know, I'd sit around for a little while. Then I would graciously leave, you know. But I was a kid, you know. And uh, But I, was, I remember seeing Andrew White in there and Shirley Horn and, you know, mm. some of the of Stanley Turrentine. I mean, he was bringing everybody in there because Bill Harris, man, he was, you know, he was widely known and he had the, um, the Clovers. They they were old R&B group. He was yeah, pretty yeah. much one of the founding members of the Clovers and stuff. So this guy, you know, he had been around and, um, and he did a lot for DC, for the jazz scene and stuff. Then there were other clubs around town where we would go Mr. Wise on Rhode Island Avenue, Moore's Love and Peace, Alves Lounge. It was a lot of places where they would have open jam sessions. And, and I mean, you were talking about some musicians, man. And mm. I was just a kid. And Buck Hill, Webster Young, I mean, Major G. These, these, these players were great players. But, you know, you look at what makes somebody famous, you know. And um, some of these people had families and they didn't leave to go to New York, everybody, you got to go to New York or whatever. And they stayed with their families, but these, they were great players. So I was, I had so much inspiration as a kid, man, just living, just living in DC, you know? Yeah. yeah and like yeah. I said, we listened to the records. We listened to the records. We listened to everybody, man. You, We listened to everybody. My brother came back with a crate of albums. He had, he had, um, he had like, he like he liked Stanley Turrentine a lot. But then he had John Coltrane, and he, and he had blues, Howlin' Wolf. I remember first year hearing Howlin' Wolf, man. That, that guy blew my mind, man. You know, something about his voice and the raw energy, you know, that, you know, and, 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 and you, could, you, could feel, you could feel the power in his voice. And you think about, one of the things I think about, and where I really respect blues, where I think a lot of people look down on blues. They think it's a music of a, downtrodden people and stuff but for me right. blues is a music of victory and it's like a bomb over the pain and the suffering of uh the jim crow and the oppression it's actually a bomb and it brought good feelings to people even though it also nursed um your pain and stuff but yes, it helped it helped ease your pain and when i listen to those guys some of the songs that they sing where they talk about um, like the Negro spirituals in, in, in the blues, it's double entendre. They're talking about what's going on. Yes, sir. You know? And I remember, I remember Howlin' Wolf has this one song, How Many More Years Am I Going to Let You Keep Dogging Me Around? You know, and this stuff came out before the, um, Martin Luther King's and the Civil Rights Movement really reached the height. Just like um, Muddy Waters was singing, uh, I'm a man. I'm a full-grown man. No B, no O, no I. I'm a man, you know, and, 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 you know, a lot of people don't realize how important the blues was in, you know, just strengthening people's resolve to keep on kicking, you know? Yes. And, um, so when I heard Howlin' Wolf and that man, he sounded like a giant, you know, and he's roaring on it through his voice, man, he really touched me. And then you listen to the songs and they're telling little, little stories. Like I said, they're double entendre. You might be saying, how many more years I'm going to let you dog you around to a woman? But that is not who he's talking about. He's talking about to the oppressors of this society, you know? And uh, so that stuff started really touching me. While at the same time, my father, he played all of the jazz vocalists. That was his thing, you know? Nat Cole. I grew up all the time listening to Nat Cole my father loved Joe Williams. He loved Billy Eckstein, mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra, you know, Tony Bennett. 
Then you have the ladies, Ella, Sarah, Billy Holiday, you know, uh, 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 the coldest station, Donna Washington. So I grew up with that all the time. And then, like I said, as we started getting older, and I'm number five out of six, now we get a little record player, got a little money for um, doing your chores. We going to the Waxy Maxi or wherever and buying 45s, right? <laughs> My first 45 was James Brown. <laughs> James, James Brown was kicking, man. You know, a lot of y'all jazz guys, pap, y'all think that music ain't nothing? You crazy. That music is still selling today. That's soul music. That music touches you in your soul. And it's connected to the roots. When I'm talking about Muddy Waters, come on, you can't get much deeper than Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters. You know, you go into your roots of the music. And, the, and, and to me, jazz is like the fruit on the trees. But the root of it, the music is the blues. Yeah, yeah. And you listen to Charlie Parker, he played a blues, blues riff on every solo he played. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to say, yo, you can't play the blues scale. Can't play the Why not? The whole church thing, the whole thing is based on those blue notes. That's right. But without right. those notes, you might as well just play European music, you yeah. know? And so what's blue about that? But, you mean, know, man. I mean, I've studied music extensively, and I studied the psychology of the music. I studied the history of the music. And, um, you know, I just think people have gotten so far away from, from really reaching and speaking to the people through the music. You okay. know, a lot of guys can play beautifully. They play a lot, whereas they say a lot of information. But are you speaking to the people? Yeah. yeah. Are you touching their hearts? Are you making a difference right there as opposed to, oh, yeah, he can play real fast. Oh, he plays a lot of notes. But I'm like, what is he saying? You know, it's just like writing. If you're just going to just keep on going on on and you got to have a pause somewhere and you got to say something. Well, that's why I'm thinking music is about, you know, it's a conversation. Yeah, so yeah. I don't I don't base it on I don't base what I do on style. I like all music. If I play a C a chord, if I'm playing country and western, if I'm playing bluegrass, if I'm playing jazz, if I'm playing gospel, I'm playing whatever I play, RB, a C chord is a C chord. Wherever you put it. Next chord, you go to an E seven or whatever, it's an E seven chord. So I listen to music more from a structural point of view. You know, I mean, you got to listen to the aesthetics, the feel. What does it make you feel? Does it move you? Yes. You know what I mean? Does it move you? Does it please you? But also, I I don't really say I don't listen to a song per se, because there's so many songs that are just borrowed from other songs. So I hear the basic structures. And if you look at the record business, the record business had so much to do with... Um, shaping the outcome of the music. Okay. And um, when you start talking about influences, I, I, I after um, I started playing in the late 60s and then towards the middle of the 70s, now my brother comes back, he brings John Coltrane into my life, right? And even before that, it was before that, he brought Jimi Hendrix into my life. And I'm like, this is some different stuff from listening to uh, uh, like I said, the, my father's music, Nat Cole, Curtis, you know, you listen yeah. to Curtis Mayfield and James Brown. All. Now you listen to the Hendrix and, and this is some way out stuff, right? You listen to the Coltrane play Ohm or something like that. You know, it's like, wow, this music is so far out. And um, it, 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 it breaches on what they call psychedelic, you know? It's <laughs> like some stuff from another realm. So you yeah, go and yeah. listen to something like Charlie Mingus or you listen to Ornette Coleman, you know? I remember the first Ornette Coleman I listened to was called Twins. And it was two trios playing at the same time. And one of them, or let's say two groups. One of them, he had Eric Dolphy on one side and Ornette Coleman on the other side, right? And then they had the rhythm sections playing. And I mean, it's like being, it's like being out to sea in a storm. Yeah. Now, I know you've done the cruise ships, right? You've been out to sea in a bad storm. Yes, I have. Well, man, listening to that music, it's like that because, you know, it's it's free. It's what they call free jazz. So everything is just moving. It's torrential, you know? And uh, 
I thank God that those guys made that music, even though it's not like music that people listen to every day. You know, right, right. I thank God, Sun Ra. I thank God that they made that music because they expanded. They expanded the parameters in a, instead of just playing notes. They're playing sound. You know, you hear all the sounds of the universe, man. You know, Train when he started stretching out. In, in, in towards um, his later period, you hearing all the sounds of the universe, any sound that could be produced, you know, and not just based on a 12 tone diatonic system, you know? And uh, man, I I got caught up into that music for a long time, you know, I'll be honest. And, uh, and the thing about it, you you know, the longer we play, you, the, digger you, the deeper you go, you, you, you like being in quicksand, you know, the, the more you the more you move, the quicker you sink. So you just don't get out of it because you keep searching for searching for something else. That's me. You know, I know uh, some of the things that I play. I I play very as little as possible with the stuff that I play. I want it to mean something. You know, so I definitely understand what you're saying, man. And I I I can I can listen to that from now on because right now I'm getting a lesson. You know, and I I applaud you, man, for. Uh, doing what you're doing. Now let's talk about, uh, on this note, I know you got some stories. Tell me some of the some of the most uh, funniest stories and things that you've encountered during your travels and playing. Oh, man. You already smile. You already <laughs> starting to laugh. I got some stories I can't tell. That's why I'm laughing. Just tell first what you thing, can. First thing I got to say about you, though, I want to say about your playing, and I like the way you play because, like, every tap and everything that you do means something you're not just all over the drums you know and you leave so much room for all the other players and all the other music to be heard and to express itself so first of all you're not bashing some dramas that you know and i understand the power and the dynamics but it must be dynamics there must be yes. points it's like a it's like it ought to be high points and low points you know and 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 that's how life is. That's how making love is. It's not just boom the whole you know. And it has to be a build up and a crescendo and a decrescendo and 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 a coming down and 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 it can, you know, just like in waves, it can come and go. You know, yeah, and yeah. way the way you play, I always like because you leave space. You can hear in between. You can hear the music. You know, you can hear what's going on. You're not playing so loud that people can't hear you. And everything that you do is a part of the song. You know, you're not bringing something just, oh, I'm going to play these chops. I heard Billy Cobham do this. And, you you know, it, what you're doing is it matches the song. It's in context. It's totally appropriate. So you know, they, some of the guys might get mad at me. I don't care. I will really can go really deep and talk about it, you know, but I'm not going to go deep because... What I got to say might not be all that popular. And like I said, the record companies had so much to do with controlling what people are listening to, even the radio right. stations. That's why it's called commercial music, commercial radio. So I just wanted to add that. And I just wanted to tell you, I really appreciate your approach to music. And you've been on so many great recordings. You've played with so many great people. And, and you're not out there trying to overpower the music when you play. I gotta give you, I gotta give that to you, you know? These Thank you, my brother. Just, Thank you. Yeah, and you're not trying to over the power of the audience either, you know? You're playing finesse and with taste. And I really, I really, I have to acknowledge that, you know, and, and that's something that I strive to do and I continue. It's a music is a school. And yeah, playing yeah. with guys like you, you know, it teaches you uh self-restraint and discipline and how to refine what you're doing, you know, and you know. I guess it's a journey for all of us, man. You know, I'm I'm still studying, man. Every day, every time I get on stage with you, cats, man, it's it's an experience. For whoever I'm playing with, uh, it's an experience. You know, I I remember talking about bashing back in my rock and roll days. I used to have my cymbals nine feet up in the air. I used to <laughs> jump up and hit them and grab them and sit back down. See how fast and flashy I could do that. I know I was playing with Ray Charles once. I did all the and uh, jumped up, grabbed the cymbals and bass. He turned around and said, I, 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 wait a minute, baby. You know? <laughs> he said, he said, uh, you know, he said, this this ain't your show. Ain't nobody come here to see you. 
you know, say one day your name will be on the marquee. Then you show off, you shoot all the arrows you want. But until then, stay out the way. That lasted to me to this very day as we speak, you know. Anyway, thank you for that wonderful compliment, man. Thank you so much. I love your heart, man. Yeah. Now, I want to know more about them funny stories. Oh, you know what? I tell you, um, my stories, uh, Rose stories are kind of, uh, the ones that I think funny, that would be my sense of humor might be a little gross for some people, man. I, I, and then, like, um, I have some other stories. They're not necessarily funny, you know? I mean, I've been ran out a few towns by, you know, uh, you know the the southern the southern boys. I did it. I did the uh, southern circuit for a lot of years with a guy named Little Royal. You know, and um, he okay. was he, he patted himself after James Brown, but he was a dynamic performer. I loved playing with him year after year. He wore me out. That man, that man had to have three different outfits because he sweated so hard. He worked so hard. He danced and he performed. You know, and and I know we played and uh, um, we played. For years, we played up and down the East Coast, from Canada to Florida. We we played at hotels, and and uh, so we would play a week or two weeks in a place, or maybe three weeks or a month in a few places. So we went everywhere from all all the beach resorts down in Florida. We played through Myrtle Beach, Atlantic Beach, um, going all the way up and playing in um, Massachusetts, all of these different places, and. Uh, playing up in Canada. So the audience was very diverse. I'll use those terminologies, you know. Very good. Yeah, some I of the southern towns, you know, um, it was a lot of separation. So so in those a lot of those towns, it wasn't like it wasn't like in a, a, a major city where you have um nightclubs and restaurants. They would have maybe places to eat. That stuff closes up at dark. And so people would go to the hotels and the hotels would have a lounge, and that would be where we would we would be. So I guess we were classified as lounge lizards at that point, you know. Yeah. And uh, we're doing all of this stuff, and we're playing basically dance music, right? Pop music. We're killing it. And uh, so uh, you know, sometimes you know the ladies want to uh, hook up with us in the different towns, right? So I don't know who's seeing this. I don't want nobody to get mad. I want a girl. I want no girls to get mad at me, man. But. <laughs> Man, I was on the road, man. Come on, man. Look, I remember down in South Carolina, right outside of Myrtle Beach, right? We playing Myrtle Beach, right? And uh, we playing in the, in the, um, they do the shag. They listen to the old R&B, the stuff we grew up listening to on the AM. They call it shag music. I'm like, we used to call it Odie but goodies or black gold. You know? And so here I am. And then um, some people invited us to come to this club, right? And uh, man, we had to grow through the, go, we drove through the reeds. It was no lights out there, man. You know what I mean? And we go, we drove through the reeds. The reeds were like 12 feet high or something. And you just riding down a dirt road with rocks and gravel. And then you get down the end of this road and it's a shack, right? And uh, so, okay, we park and it's dark. It's no lights. Only you got a gazillion stars in the sky and you got the moon. You go in this joint, man, and they got like a light bulb hanging from a wire. And that's the light in the club, right? And it's like holes in the floor. The stairs is, is rickety. You got to go in the screen door. And I mean, I'm in there and it's dark in there, right? And it's just, just a couple of us in the group went, right? And uh, man, you know, it's a bar. And, you know, you see the old signs advertised, the neon signs and stuff. It's like old time. It's like being back in the 50s or something, right? And I go in there and next thing I know, this woman come over there and start flirting with me, right? But her man is sitting at the daggone bar. So she's flirting with me. I guess she's trying to make this dude jealous, right? Yeah, yeah, Next yeah. thing I know, uh -oh. dude and his boys is coming at me, right? And look, I'm backing out the door. But it's holes in the floor with a, like maybe a little, <laughs> little wood or something. Over. I'm trying to make sure I don't step in one of these holes, man. Man, we had to get out of that place, man. And I tell you. We've had that experience in quite a few places down south, you know. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a fun experience. One time we had this uh, we had a white drummer with us, and we were in a black club, and it was like during our Thanksgiving during the Thanksgiving holiday, everybody comes back home. So this place was a really large club, and we played there earlier, 
And then um, later on, we're still in there. And some guy's having a, a tussle with his girlfriend. And the only white boy in that place, he got to be going over there to break it up. <laughs> Next thing I know is a gunshot, man. And you're talking about four, 500 people. Everybody's running in every different direction. And first thing me and the bass player said, oh, that's Tom. And we had to go back down there while all of this craziness is going on and grab him. And, he, you know, he had been drinking too much, so he was crazy. And we had to get him out of there. So we got him out of there. Now, everybody... All these people are from that that area, so everybody knows each other. We got them down. The owner of the club, we got them down on the floor in the Cadillac, right? The old big old Cadillac, -y, right? We down south, and this fool's still talking to, talking smack, man. We trying to get you out of here alive, and the guys are everybody's looking to see where we are. Where's he at? Where's he at? Man, you know I've seen, I had some scary stuff, man. I I can all yeah. tell you. I could go on and on about them stuff. I ain't gonna talk about that stuff, man. Go on, man. <laughs> I I was out there for a lot of years, Manny. So I wasn't on the big circuit like you. You know what I mean? Oh, I was on, on man. I was I, on the I, hotel you know, circuit, I, baby. I I played the chitlin circuit. I played I played I played the, the, the juke joints too. So uh, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. Hey, man. Uh, I got I want to I want to get down to what you're doing. What are, What are some of the things that you're working on now? You doing You do working on recording. You do. What are you doing? Let's talk about. Uh, what you're currently doing and what you got planned tours or shows coming up. Yeah. Well, I tell you, um, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff with a lot of different people, you know, and it's, it's good. Variety is good. Sometimes you can feel like you get spread a little too thin because you can yeah. make in these rehearsals and you have to learn a lot of music and it, it, it really, uh, if you don't have the energy and as I'm older, I don't, I have the same drive and energy that I had when I was younger, but I just still, still love, music i love everything about it i love the people i play with mostly you know i don't love all of them but i love most of them though you know because good people man you know and yeah, yeah. Uh, and the guys they, they 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 respect the craft you know they do what they got to do they take care of business you know and good people you know and so um I find myself in a lot of different situations. I guess the guitar being is, is kind of a unique instrument, you know, because I could be a part of the rhythm section and, and then, then you can take the lead and things, you know, and, um, and I do sing. So that puts me in a, and I'm an entertainer more. So I consider That's myself, you, yes, you, you know, I'm an entertainer who can play, you yeah. know? And like I said, I don't really look at genres of music that much because I look at time periods more so than genres. I look at time periods. This is what they were doing in the 40s. This was what they were doing in the 50s. This was what they were doing in the 60s, the 70s. Even though you have overlap, you know what I mean? Because the music is never going to die. Right, the music right. is never going to die. So you have overlap. I mean, I remember as a kid, I had to learn it don't mean a thing if it ain't got a swing by Duke Ellington. You know, I remember my mother coming down here making me listen to Billie Holiday and learn God Bless the Child. I'm a kid, man. I'm still in school, you know? So... My father telling me, you got to learn the classics. You got to learn the standards, you, you know, the Duke, Ellington, and all of that. So I remember all of that as a kid. And at the same time, I'm playing R&B and rock at the same time. So, you know, you got all of those influences, man, you know. And like I tell you, to me, is to me, I just call it black music. So if my white folks out there, if you get mad, so what, you know? I call it black music. That's what it is. And when you look at TV now, what? Who, who everybody's playing black music now? Yeah. So we not we not we not playing. I'm just gonna put it like that. I'm gonna let it go. Folks gonna not gonna like what I say, but that's what it is. You know. Bottom and, line. And it all comes from the blues. You know. Are you are are you doing any uh, recording? Are you planning to do any shows or tours? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing a lot of stuff actually. I don't really want to let all the cats out the bag at one time. I be I'll be honest. I'm actually working on a, a, a recording right now with some people, and it's uh, doing uh, songs from the Underground Railroad, mm. and uh, so it's interesting. It ain't jazz. It ain't necessarily blues, but it's blues. It's root music. You know what I mean? It's root music. I mean, get some mud on your feet, man. You know, it's songs from the and like I said, it's some songs about victory. It ain't about sitting around crying. It's about yeah, surviving yeah. and getting free. You know, freedom. And we still fighting for freedom today. I don't care what nobody says. You can think we ain't. We still fighting for freedom. 
you know so i'm doing i'm i'm very interested in doing that and it's it just changing the pace man changing the flavor you know all mm. acoustic no electric instruments you know no. oh yeah i i know oh, interesting actually i'm a, i'll let the let the cat out the bag okay so i've well, been um I'll be looking forward when you when you get it out. I'm I'm I, I want to be the first to know about it. Okay, well, matter of fact, I know about it right now, so I'm waiting to get it and hear it. Okay, well, I'm gonna just tell you, I'm kind of arranged some of this stuff, and 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 I'm doing the producing it. But uh, it's it's a lady in uh, her name is Linda Harris, and she's been doing the uh, Harriet Tubman Museum. And I know who you're talking a, about. You know, what I'm talking about. She's doing a series of. Uh, a concert's called uh, Jazz at the Mirror, and they have in East in Cambridge, Maryland, they have a Harriet Tubman Museum, and uh, it's been in place play for 50 years, and they have a giant mirror of Harriet Tubman on the wall, reaching out her hand, and um, so you know, uh, the idea just popped up. Hey, let's do songs of the Underground Railroad, you know. So I'm actually playing an instrument called the banjo guitar. And it's a guitar, but it's a banjo all married together. So uh, it's tuned just like a guitar, and it has six strings, where banjo, you got a four-string and a five-string banjo. And they function a little bit differently. The four-string banjo is the first four strings of the guitar. So they just added two more. You know, yeah, the banjo guitar, okay? So we're banjo. doing stuff like Old Freedom and... Let my people go, and I got shoes. You know, you got shoes. All God's children got shoes. You know, we're doing mm -hmm. stuff like that with a nice frisky beat. Emery Diggs on bass, and um, Greg Holloway, but he's not playing a trap set. He's playing a washboard. He's playing a <laughs> <laughs> really. Oh yeah, yeah. He's got a tambourine and stuff. So we just using three pieces. We ain't using no overdubs and none of that stuff. Everything is done live, and it's 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 like organic. You know what I mean? Yeah, Some yeah. of the songs might not go exactly the way you used to hearing them in church or wherever you heard them, but it's an organic experience. And uh, and I think it's going to be good um, that, you know, it's a flavor. It's a different flavor, you yeah, know, yeah. and I think it's going to be beautiful. That's what I think personally, you know, and and um, we're coming up on the 200 year celebration of Harriet Tubman's birth. So this is, uh, you know, people, people, they talk about Martin Luther King and, um, George Washington Carver, and they mentioned about Harriet Tubman, but they don't really give the depth of what this woman was able to accomplish and the influence and everything. So I figured, I said, well, you know, this is a good way, especially the, the 200th anniversary, maybe they're going to get her on a $20 bill like they've been talking. So this is going to be a, you know, that's one of the projects we're working on right now. Actually, um, Thursday, I got to go in there and, and just do a little editing on it. And uh, so it's coming along. It's coming so along. So basically, is it, you're doing the production, the arranging, or so is it basically pretty much uh, finished now? I got to go listen to it. it, it we recorded um, Sunday, you know. We recorded uh, about, I don't know, about eight or nine tracks Sunday, you know, so. Really? And one, that's fantastic, man. Yeah. So after, you know, it was time to get on out of there and just clear, clear, you know, clear your mind. It's getting late. So I didn't really sit sit in there and nitpick and, and go through the tracks, you know. So that's going to be Thursday. I'll do a little bit of that. So that's one of the things, you know, I, um, let me see. I just recently did a, a real nice show last Monday. Um, not this Monday, last Monday. I played, man, I played so many times last week, the last few weeks. And that's why I say the diversity. One minute you're playing R&B, one minute you're playing jazz, one minute, you you know, we did those songs of the Underground Railroad. Try to get a video. I think they, they were trying to stream it, but it was like some kind of problem with the internet, you know. And, um, uh, okay, so now coming up, on Monday the fourteenth, okay, I'll be the featured artist at Westminster Church. On that's the blues night, so I have my guys with me: Greg, Emery. Uh, I think Ben Ben Sands is going to play sax, and Peter Fresran is going to play play uh, keyboard, and we're going to uh, do the blues of the underground rail. Re no, I'm going to do blues and whatever I feel like doing. We did the uh, Mid Atlantic Jazz Festival a couple of weeks ago, and yes. I do a variety. Of music. Yeah, I do a variety of music. It depends on where I go. And everybody in there was playing jazz. I said, "What's the point of me playing jazz? I just do what I like to do," you know. And I did um, 
I did the uh, concert series at the Leisure World a couple of months ago, and it was in December. I played jazz the first part of the night, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then I just went and did the things that I like to do. I'm more into roots music these days, you know. But then, yeah. you know, you were in there, what? Uh, when were you in there? The, uh, was that January? No, I was I was in there February, uh, February 11th. February, right. And I was at your show. Your show was really, really nice, slick. Y'all guys, man, y'all are just, just awesome, you know? Y'all were smooth, man. <laughs> the people loved it. You had everybody eat, eating out of your hand, you know? <laughs> Come on, man. It was beautiful, man. Well, yeah. hey, man, uh, those players that you just talked about, Linda Harris, Greg, and Emery, uh, I also know those those people. Would you please tell them I said hello and I send my regards? I w oh, absolutely, we'll do. Please, please do. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think they're all fantastic people. They're beautiful oh. people. And hey, look, when that when the recording gets finished, I'll make sure you get a I'll make sure you get an earful of it. You know, is there is there a title of it? Right? Do you have a title yet? Um. I think songs of the Underground Railroad or something, something to that. Yeah. You know, still, 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 you know, still haven't finished the pro project yet. You know, yeah. And, and that, that's gonna make me get back to recording. You know, I got a, several albums in me that I want to record, but like you know, with the pandemic and everything, it was like, what's the point? You know, <laughs> yeah. well, we don't know when we're gonna play again, and then you go in and spend a bunch of money producing your own recording and because I would have to finance it myself, you know, and then, then you can't sell it. So what's, I'm like, you know, the way the internet works, all the streaming platforms out there, they're streaming everybody's music, but I don't know if the musicians are making much of anything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And, and that's a problematic situation, you know, um, that's a problematic situation. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think and I hope and pray that things, uh, I think we've all taken a beating for the last year and a half, two years uh, because of the pandemic. But now I think that things are starting to loosen up a little bit and maybe, maybe uh, we'll get back out there pretty quick. I'm hoping, I'm looking forward to that, man. I miss it, you know. Yeah, I hope so too. A lot of, I know a lot of the places that people would have traditionally been playing are no longer in existence, you know, and that, you know, so you wind up with a lot more people trying to, you know, play and, you know, you have fewer spots. But, you know, um, one of the things about me being born in D.C. and living here and I have a lot of long term connections with the people in the music world. So I get a lot of calls, you know, and um, I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for those people calling me. And uh, they're good people. That's why I go out and play because. And I've been playing since the 60s a lot of times, you know. As I'm getting older, sometimes my energy doesn't want to crank up to get, you know, you got to get up and you got to load that stuff in the car and you got to get... No, and that's not no joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm older now, so when I was young, I ran out there just to having my ball, you know. But, uh, you know, I still... Now you got to say, oh, man, I got to go load up, this, load up this stuff, man. Yeah. I know just what you're saying. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, do. Like, not like not like being on them big concert stages anymore where uh, all I have to do is go sit down behind the drum set. You know, even like when I'm on a ship now, I don't have to do anything. But just go sit down. And if something's wrong, I'll make a phone call and somebody come fix it, you know. But being at home uh, is almost back to when we had to do it ourselves. So I'm back to doing it myself now, like you. It's not like just picking up a... A, a 90 pound trap case and just walking out the door with it. Now I got to think about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, go all right. You got to go up and down some steps. Got to man. Push that thing in the back. Oh, man. <laughs> push that box. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Then you got to get the gig. You play the gig, then you got to do it all over again, man. Take it out of it. That's right, man. And, and, hey, man, and, well, what, um, as we uh, get down to close, what, what are, what are, uh, what advice can you give to, I'm going to say, some of the up-and-coming players, young players? I, I know that you're an educator. So when you're in your classroom settings, what are some of the things that you talk about? How do you encourage them, keep them encouraged on to doing uh, and pushing forward? Ex talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that, that's an interesting subject. And uh, 
I, I'm teaching at Duke Ellington. I'm just teaching guitar now. You know, I, I taught I taught 25 years in the D.C. public school. I taught music, you know, and uh, it was a good thing for me because at that point I, I had gotten married and I had children and, you know, I came off the road. I wasn't just traveling all over the place. I wanted to be with my family and um, I wanted to do my due diligence like my father did. You know, my father stayed with us and he took care of us. I wanted to do the same thing. That was my motto, you know. And um, so my kids are grown now and I started playing again. But I retired after um, 25 years because you know, it's a it's a tough job teaching teaching children in the inner city is a very demanding job. So, and I kind of I kind of was burnt out, you know. So I retired. But then recently, with the pandemic, um, the guy that was teaching his name is uh, Ike Daniel. He was teaching um, orchestra and guitar at Duke Ellington, and he moved into the vice principal position. So he called me and asked me to come. And it was like perfect timing because that was right when the pandemic started um, and things shut down like February. By April, I was working um, part time teaching, but it was all through Zoom. So it was interesting. It was good. I got to meet the students and work with them. So the things, you know, I stress about about uh, to the students, you know, first, you got to learn the technique of your instrument and then you you have to you have to learn how to read, you know, mostly like. When you go out here and jam, and or you just playing music, especially the popular music, it's no, it's not a much bunch of reading, you know. It may be some charts, but as you as you advance and get higher up, you will find yourself in the company of people who are very educated and very learned, and so you have to be able to read music because that's the uh, that's the media. That's one of the media outside of just using your ear, is that put you on the same page with everybody else, you know? And uh, so I stress that all the time. And and I must admit, I'm going to be real honest, guitar player's weakness, Achilles heel, is reading. And mm. you know they got a saying, they say, how do you get a guitar player to turn down? Put some music in front of me. Put some music in front of him, baby. <laughs> you know the guys are coming in with their, with their real fancy guitars and all their effects pedals and their big amp and they ready to go. You put that music in front of them, boy, you know. Blink. Right, right. Because, see, like, you know, you playing, like, say, if you playing some Led Zeppelin or something like that, there is no music for that. You know, you got to play that by ear. But you get in there and the guy start putting out some charts and put some music in front of him, oh, my God. And so that's what I constantly stress to these uh, kids. And also, you know, I I'll be honest, too. This is something that might be controversial, but I'm very controversial. I would not stress for a child today to get a degree in music education, to get a degree in music, because you saw what happened during the pandemic. The most educated and most qualified musicians in the world were not working. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, and, and yes, you were sir. lucky if you had a job teaching because when in this education system, when the money goes funny and the budgets cuts, they cut the music program and the art program That's and then the physical education program. Those are the programs that cut, cut first. But if you do decide to go to school for music, make sure you do get your credentials to teach because in the lean years and in the in-between years, you can make some money teaching. You can maybe even get a health care plan because a lot of musicians out here are playing because they love it. They're playing from their heart. But they don't have that, you know. They don't. They're not having a retirement check coming. They don't have health care, and that's a situation you don't want to be caught in because, you know, it's life is already hard enough, and being yeah. a musician is a hard life. You know, you're going from gig to gig. It's not like you're you're on a salary. You know where you're going to be playing. Like you said, you were you were with a couple of national acts, or you can even call them international acts. Y'all had managing. You had agency you had the whole thing laid out you had an itinerary but just living in a city and taking gigs here and there you don't have it like that that's right and a you lot know, of, a lot of people you know, they, they get married and they'd be blessed to have a a, a a wife and a partner that has health care and things like that so yeah. so you get that but but if you're out there on your own and you don't have it man it could be really a tough thing you know so 
I stress those things to the students, you know, and and I also stress find your own truth. And that's a big one. Find your own truth. Not what somebody else says. You have to find you. Where do you belong in the in the world of music? Where is your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? You know what I mean? Uh, who is your target audience that you want to play with? Who 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 are the musicians that you want to play with? And so you gotta you gotta prepare and you gotta do the um the work to accomplish those goals. I agree with you one hundred percent, man. You know, and on that note, I would like to ask you one more question before uh, I hate to cut. I hate to, I hate to say turn you loose, but to, I got to. How can uh, how how can how can we locate you? I mean, you have a website, email. Would you mind sharing that with us? Okay, okay. My email as well as as well as uh, you've already talked about the underground, your new project. Now, do you have a CD out now that you would like to talk about before we? Uh, okay, give me a give me a let me let me go for a second. Let me see where the. Okay, so this is a copy of the CD I did. It's called Urban Blues. I don't know if you're getting a good picture of it. I got it with your with your red hat on. Yeah, baby, my, my red hat, my red guitar, and that's called Urban Blues. I it's three originals on there that I wrote, and then there's some cover songs by some of the great blues um, artists, you know. And uh, um, I will have that on sale at uh, Westminster on Monday, the 14th of March. Um, on the 12th of March, I'll be doing a program in um, Cambridge, Maryland, celebrating the, the Harry Tubman Museum's 50th anniversary. And you will also be talking about the 200-year um, birth of Harry Tubman and um, Jarman, Mr. Um, Bill Jarman and Linda Harris have put this thing together. And okay. so, and she has a concert series too called Jazz at the Mural. It is, uh, I'm going to see, I don't know, what is it, the second Sunday of the month. So she has it lined up all the way up to like November, you know. Tracy Cutler will be the first artist there in April. And uh, so she has a good lineup coming. And um, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so let me tell you, um, my website is davidbcolemusic.com. And I had to put... I had to put that B in there, music, because there's another guy that David Cole, he was with the group called The Music Factory. He was a drummer. I think he was a drummer, and he he died, you know. But so if you hit David Cole, you're going to get so much of that. So I put davidbcolemusic.com. Now, okay. that's my website, and my uh, email is uh, davidbcole at hotmail.net. So I can, I'm easily to be reached. And, uh, you, you know, hit David Cole and hit blues. Oh, Main Street Blues is the name of my group. David Cole and Main Street Blues will pop up. Yeah. So, let me let me let me add a couple of things. So, see, you are asking me about some of the people I played with. I didn't get to really run that down, but I currently play with Bobby Felder's big band. It's called the Capital City All Stars, and almost everybody in that band is a music teacher. So it's That's really what fun. I've heard. Yeah. Those guys. Yeah. It's 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 a lot of us. Sometimes we go out as a um, like a. 14 piece group you know it'd be it's 10 horns four piece rhythm section and he'll use two he'll use anywhere from three to four vocalists and then sometimes he scales it down um and just uses four horns so and uh so it's it's you know it's a ball playing with them and uh uh let's see i play with sandra johnson sandra y johnson and we we do anything from r&b old school from the 50s and the 60s to um jazz and, okay. she, and so we do the uh we do the um the senior centers they're like recreation centers for seniors we were doing the nursing homes but when the pandemic came out in the germs now nah, we're not doing those yeah, and yeah, so yeah. then you know i play a lot with west bowels and west bowels yeah big bad bad west bowels and, and west a lot bowels of people... is my guest tomorrow oh good he's on my, he's, he's on my next show well, that's a bad man. So yeah, he... I got West Biles coming up. Uh, I got Dennis Chambers coming up. All right, Lewis Nash is coming up. Uh, a lot of players I got coming up, man. And I, 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 I put you right in that same category as heavyweights. 
Well, you the heavyweights, you know. Bless bless you, God, I don't know if I if I if I'm up of that caliber, but you know, hey man, whatever it is, it's my heart is in what I do. My heart is as big as anybody else's heart for for this music, and, and this yes, is our, this is our heritage. This is our culture. My heart is as big as anybody else's. My name might not be big as them, and my talent might not be big as them, but ain't but nobody got a bigger heart than I got. I know that for sure, you know? I know that for a fact, too. Yeah. On that note, uh, speaking of uh, new projects, I have a new project. It's called uh, Manny Kellogg and Friends, speaking of jazz, East Coast to West Coast. And it's also available on all the streams. So uh, get on out there and pick up, uh, pick up our, pick up our material, pick up our projects. Uh, we would definitely appreciate it. We thank you so much, man. It's been such a pleasure having you here with me and spending this last hour. It's just been, uh, I'm just humbled, man. Not only is you being a great player, I know a lot of great players, but to me, if you got a bad attitude, you're a bad player, man. And you, you a great player but your heart is big and that makes you a great person to me. I love you, man. And I'm looking forward to the next time of us getting down and playing again together. On that note, man, here's to David Cole. Thanks All for right, coming. Thank you. All thank right, God you, bless. All love right. you too, Manny. All right, God bless. We hope you enjoyed the show and thank you for keeping jazz alive. Don't forget to follow us on our social media channels. All the links are in the podcast description.